Greetings, mammalians. <clears throat> oh, welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> this is Monday morning post Super Bowl Sunday, where one of us, one of us, just one of us, and I'll lead our discerning audience to figure out who <laughs> drank a little too much. I drank all the beers. Yeah. Yeah. We went to a brewery with friends, met some amazing people. Had a good time. Won a lot of random gambling. Uh, but yes, drank way too much. Sorry, mom, if you're listening to this. What kind of bets did you place, Badger? Uh, ooh. Uh, yeah, some ran- let me uh, Let me recite you the prop bets here. I need to open oh, my, my goodness. to-do list. There were, there were, there were bets on uh, how many glasses would be broken in the bar, whether anybody uh, would be thrown out. They weren't. It was a well-behaved venue. Uh, how whether we would see any Taylor Swift merchandise in the bar? We didn't. Turns out. Oh wow! Just on TV a lot. Yep. Um, and then I had like an actual money bet on the actual match. Um, and I don't know if there's an investing lesson in here or not. I've got no idea. Apologies, I'm still drunk. Um, like I put a modest bet on that when on the Kansas City Chiefs because uh, why not? Uh, pre-match like a few days ago, and I got like kind of evens on that. And then I love backing the underdog. So they were looking like a significant dog. And I was getting like three to one. So I just went all in with my uh, uh, my uh, Betfair account. And then in the last, sorry if this is a spoiler, spoiler warning, like skip ahead if you haven't watched the result yet. Uh, in the last three seconds of overtime, uh, they won the match. And so, yes, my bet came in. <laughs> <laughs> Badger, is there a difference between degenerate gambling and investing? Uh, there should be. There should be. But there are, there are many commonalities. <laughs> is there an investing lesson from my gambling experience yesterday? I've got no idea. Uh, like, it's never over till it's over. Oh, that's is that an a investing good one. lesson? Yeah, that's a good one. I played, played my Super Bowl Sunday card the other way. I felt curmudgeonly. Mm-hmm. And I wanted nothing to do with uh, society and, and culture. And uh, I drank hot tea and watched Queer Eye for a Straight... <laughs> queer, but not Queer Eye for a Straight Guy, just Queer Eye on Netflix. Uh, which, one of us, which one of us is 50 and which one is like a, a youth again? I'm forgetting. Are you the old man suddenly? <laughs> well, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a youth. youth. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> anyway... Rumor has it that Super Bowl Sunday has, you know, deteriorated into commercial watching or voyeurism. Did you see anything? And, and, and from from an investing standpoint, I will say that it is fascinating for me to think about how much money and time goes into corporations and businesses okay. fine tuning their thirty second ad and whether it's worth, you know, all all the money. Yeah. And also as a kind of barometer of the zeitgeist, you know, like mm-hmm. what are the commercials about in general? You know, like what a couple are... of years ago, um, I do, you invested in Monday.com. We use Monday. Oh, it's like a... Oh, I, I analyzed that commercial to death. Yeah. Like they got, <laughs> they got, uh, they got slaughtered in the market actually, because it was perceived by investors that they just spent way too much money for where they are in their trajectory a couple of years ago. Yeah. On a Super Bowl commercial, like why the hell are they advertising on Super Bowl? But then, like yesterday, CrowdStrike had a pretty cool commercial, um, and I'm totally fine with that. They can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have the free cash flow, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Critical. <laughs> but any any zeitgeist like things that you that you picked up on? I mean, uh, let me say, like I think last year was it last year was kind of the crypto moment. Mm. Or was that two years? Like, no, that came up in conversation code? actually yesterday. Yeah, there was there were the only sighting of crypto was that we saw Jack Dorsey in the box with uh, Jay Z and Beyonce, and he was wearing a a crypto t shirt. I think that was the only sign of crypto. So that yeah, clearly uh, that's no longer in the zeitgeist. See, that's fascinating because you know what just happened maybe ten minutes ago. Bitcoin yeah. almost hit fifty thousand. It, it was like 49,970 or something. I, I don't know what, what it's at now. Actually, I'll tell you what it's at now. Uh, it's at, yeah, 49,73. Uh, 
uh, 30. Okay. So that's interesting. See, this is the thing about markets and cycles too. Sometimes the hype, when the hype gets ahead of itself, mm -hmm. the assets and the values, eventually the hype outwears its welcome. But if there is legitimate value, then when the hype di down, dies down, the assets tend to move in the direction of the value. That's true, but I don't know if Bitcoin's like climbing the slope of enlightenment on the, uh, like, it's Gartner, isn't it? The Gartner hype cycle. Is it, or is it still like overinflated expectations, Bitcoin? You think it's out now, like delivering real value, it's here to stay? Well, Bitcoin is strange because I mean, yeah, val I mean, it's 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 almost, it's like money itself. You know, is money? It's is the concept of money itself valuable? It's it's kind of a weird meta. <laughs> yes, if we think it does. But I point this out because, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised that if there was no real crypto talk simultaneously at this moment, Bitcoin is at its highest level since the major peak of the bull, bull run some years ago. So that's an odd correlation that yeah, suggests yeah, yeah. to me that what's driving this cycle is the actual, call it use cases or perceived value. Okay, could be, could be. And I know you're, uh, you're invested in cryptocurrency and also in Chainlink, so that's great, good for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, it's interesting, yeah. I kind of, that's right. Uh, Two of my largest holdings are Bitcoin and Chainlink, but I I think of them for for listeners discerning ears. I do really differentiate between what I think of as uh, substantial investment in the blockchain world and all the other crypto shit coins. Right. So for me, there are only three projects that are legit, and and I don't, I have two of those, the three. I got the other one, I guess Ethereum, right? That's your third one. Yeah, that's Great. right. Good. But Thank I don't you for have validating. One. Yeah. So, do, so Christoph, I'm hung over to hell. I've done no preparation for today's episode. Uh, I can barely think. What are we talking about today? What's on the agenda? Okay, I I want to make a quick uh, plug for two stocks that I've regained bullishness on. Ooh. I just added shares to one of them in uh, the King of the Jungle portfolio this morning, and that'd be none other than EOS. Oh God! No, we're not going there again, are we? Oh God! <laughs> and uh, and I also I'm really contemplating buying some shares in the Enovix. Now here's here's the here's what I'm seeing. This this is maybe um, part two of what we were just talking about. There was a supreme hype for those both those companies earlier this year. Someone then, driven by yourself. Tweeting Correct. frantically about them every day. It, it's got to come in. If it doesn't come in, I'm ruined. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Now the hype cycle has died down. So the price shares have are, are off their highs by massive amounts. But what am I seeing on the ground? Meaning on the fundamental side, I'm seeing nothing but continued progress, both in the individual companies production lines and the manufacturing side of things, but also the big picture stuff that got me interested in the first place, the massive ever increasing demand for batteries because data and basically all the AI stuff, right? Requires more energy consumption, sure. climate change, uh, grid failing, all of that stuff is ever more true at an increasing rate. So what I'm seeing Badger right now is this confluence of hypes going down, fundamentals are progressing, share prices down, like the Gardner hype cycle suggests, right? Things go up and down. And part of being great, uh, a great investor is being more like savvy and nuanced with, with your timing. Um, <clears throat> so that is why I'm kind of sniffing this moment as um, a good time to increase position. Yeah, if you're a long-time listener to this show or our previous one, Christoph lost his pants on EOS. Not on Innovix, I don't think. But, uh, but you, you know, you're a real fan of uh, batteries and energy as an investing thing. It is interesting. Like, this stuff, I'm kind of down for renewables, and I watch that sector, and I'm invested in 
end phase, and I used to be invested in uh, Solar Edge. You don't have to chase every theme. I think you were you were pestering me last week. I'll go read about Chainlink. You know, go and go and find out about this stuff. It's important. Um, it just doesn't turn me on. And for some weird reason, like your EOS and Innovix stuff doesn't really turn me on either. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, yeah, you don't have to chase every theme. And I do think there's an investing lesson in finding out the stuff that you're intrinsically interested in mm-hmm. and using that as your basis for your research because how you get all the research for free because you're just kind of reading about this stuff if you're a bit of a geek around some other random topic. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, there are plenty of ways to win in the market. Follow your passion is in a sense a, a good idea because then you care more about yep. diving more deeply. What got me fa- absolutely fascinated by the energy storage space, I talked about this before, but there is a book called The Grid. Mm-hmm. And uh, I forget the author's name at the moment, but she's an anthropologist. And the way she talked about the way, the, the, I mean, how central the electrical grid is to modern life. I mean, it just made my head uh, spin with ideas. And, you know, like I was walking around seeing all the, literal wires, things you forget, you know, are, are there. And I got deeply, deeply curious about how it all works. Why is it that the U S has such like an immature NG infrastructure, Like you guys have planned like rolling blackouts and you have brownouts and all sorts of terrible things like in the actual developed world, for example, Europe and the UK, like that doesn't happen. Power is just, it's just there like magic. Yeah, go figure. I mean, I, and I live in Texas, which has the worst uh, grid because it Texas thinks it could do everything by itself. And, and lo and behold, I've frozen my ass off uh, twice in the last three years, literally frozen my ass off because of the power outages. Anyway, um, so just putting the, the energy, the, the battery sector back on our listeners map, if I'm right to any extent, the growth ahead for these companies will be absolutely stupendous. The question is more about their financing uh, capital structures, whether they will need to dilute shareholders any further. So right. it remains to be seen, but my eyes are. That's good. But this time round, uh, manage your diversification and don't go like FOMO crazy Like you and I have been writing uh, the 10 laws of the jungle. And I think we wrote one about diversification just the other day and um, we're getting ready to publish this. So if you're interested in the Wall Street Wildlife laws of the jungle, it'll be on our website, wallstreetwildlife.com in a couple of weeks. We're pretty close now. Um, learn from this lesson and don't make the mistakes of the past going all in on uh, wildly, highly volatile companies yes so this this i think leads us to an interesting uh hopefully an interesting segment about well it's uh it's from uh it's based on this book that i'm reading and i'm showing up the five elements of uh effective thinking and what's great about this book is they 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 talk about thinking in terms of the the actual elements earth, fire, air, and water. And when I read the section on the earth, it's all about the the basic principle is understand, understanding earth, grounding yourself. So understand ideas simply. What's so in order to be an effective thinker, I think this takes us directly to Elon Musk's approach. He wants to understand the physics behind that the laws of physics say in order to help him understand what is and is not possible in the manufacturing process, for example. And because he feels he understands the physics so deeply and fundamentally, he knows what he can and can't say to engineers. And when somebody says this is impossible, he says bullshit, it is possible because the laws of physics suggest it is that kind of thing. So, uh, I don't know if this is interesting to you, Badger, but there's, you know, there's a way to, I think becoming a better investor fundamentally rests on this premise. And to harken back to what we were saying, I would wager to say that the difference between a gambler and an investor 
is that an investor takes the time to do the research, the deep research, so that they fundamentally know what they own in the vicissitudes, in the midst of the vicissitudes of the market <laughs> cycles. Because it's easy to get spooked out of an investment because of simple price volatility, right? But if you truly understand deeply or you, or you think you do what you own and why you own it, you won't be shaken out. I agree. And, and, and maybe to take the other side of that as well. Um, like it's about understanding the thesis and the things you're looking for. It's not about being, you know, treating this thing like a religion and being like slavish to this you know, in this company, this stock, the stuff can change. You know, the world can change. Leadership, they're just human. They can make bad decisions. Competitors can come out of nowhere. Like if, if you truly understand the company, you're able to assess whether the thesis is on track as an investor and then stay the course. But if something's really fundamentally broken, understanding the company very deeply allows you to more quickly recognize that and cut bait, you know, get away from that investment if it's no longer um, right for you. That's right. And one of these principles from this book is be brutally honest about what you know and don't know. Mm. And this is what's so interesting. This is counterintuitive here, but this is what got me in trouble with EOS. I, I've said this several times, but I did so much research that I mistook understanding something deeply for forgetting that there's always things that you don't know, there's the unknown unknowns, and I became too confident in the thesis. So there's, um, it's not necessarily that more is more all the time. It has to be married with, I guess, wisdom is always important. You know, have the wisdom and, uh, I guess, self awareness to know when you've gone too far or bought too much of the story because that turns it more into a gambling proposition I think is what happened to EOS uh, to me with with EOS and uh and I think there's another interesting thing here because like the sunk cost fallacy applies to your time as well and I, I find it incredibly difficult but it is so important like you I could spend days sometimes researching a company thinking oh this is my next great investment this is really interesting and then you find something that is damning and I mean, it's a bad investment objectively, but you've put all this time, tens of hours into understanding this company and, you know, your emotions are saying, well, you know, I've done the work, let's just buy it. Like, you know, let's invest in it. But you've done the work to learn that it was a bad investment. And, you know, in, re in reality, that should be happening like nine times out of 10 plus, right? Not everything is a good investment and you do need to do the work. You can't, you can't just throw darts at the board like I was doing with the Kansas City Chiefs yesterday and kind of hope that your bet comes in, right? Yeah, uh, and that speaks to another one of these principles of, of understand deeply is to do that, you have to let go of biases and the sunk cost fallacy you just talked about is a, for, is a bias. You know what's interesting to me about all these Badger is that um, biases are so inherent in how humans think that I think it requires repeated practice over and over and over again to not just know what they are and not just name them, but to almost mercilessly have, I would say, the courage to continue to turn the mirror toward oneself and know the difference between knowing them and seeing how they still affect you even after say years of trying to not be taken in by them because we're human, you know? I mean, confirmation bias being one of these dominant ones, right? I mean, I still do it all the time when I'm in that bullish mindset and, and some, something across my feed comes in that suggests a problem, like how quickly, <laughs> you know, it's tempting to not look more deeply at the criticism because it's painful. Do you think there's a, um, a confirmation bias that you're uh, under the influence of right now? Well, you tell me. So th th it's a good question. I just told you I bought additional shares of EOS. I told you the problems that, I, that could potentially arise around financing. That still hasn't been clear. And I gave you a little bit of the bull, scenario, bull case scenario and stuff about the cycles. 
Am I being biased at the moment? No, I think it's reasonable. And what you're, like what you're setting out makes sense. And like, this is, I always invest around like the question of what does the world need more of in five or 10 years time and energy. Clearly we need more of like ever increasing energy demand and ever increasing need to be able to generate renewable energy, which is a, you know, solar mostly and uh, tidal and we have to store it somewhere. So you've got to stick it in batteries or some, you know, there are other solutions, but batteries is really the best answer. So yeah, absolutely. That's right. But I think, well, and, you, and you've, you've conquered it now, but you know, your problem previously was just going far too uh, heavily allocated in tiny little high, highly risky companies like that, but uh, like an appropriately sized position in the portfolio. I wouldn't argue with either of those companies that you saw in an X. So there's an exercise that the authors suggest, which is to break down whatever big picture skills into their smaller components mm -hmm. and to diligently work at the smaller task before you get overwhelmed by the bigger one. So I think this is wise because tell me if this sounds right to you. There are many people that are scared of investing because when they think of it as one giant conglomerate, yeah, let's say they feel overwhelmed. They know it's hard. They know there's a lot of pain and uh, loss involved and things. it's impossible to get things right all the time and so forth. So they stay on the sidelines. But what, what would happen if you broke down investing into manageable bite sizes like we try to talk about and then you... You address one by one by one by one by one, continuing to deepen into each one. And over time, you you see where your strengths and weaknesses continue to be. And then you you actually become a better investor. Yeah. And, and if we make this real, like if you're listening to this podcast and you're not invested in any way, like just get started. And it doesn't have to be complex in any way. And Christoph and I, you know, we're professional stock pickers, but that you don't have to do that, right? You could just literally take a hundred bucks, you know, whatever you can afford out of your paycheck every month, stick it into a couple of passive index trackers. Um, and that's how you start your journey. So I started my journey like 20 years ago. Right. So just get started it is really, really important advice. And what that allows you to do is care, I would say you now have motivation to learn more and you could start big picture stuff and then move on to individual companies and financials and uh, risk management and the emotional stuff and the psychological stuff and all of that. But over time you do begin to synthesize yep. um, a feeling of like, yeah, this is hard, but not impossible. And you know, you're listening, you're listening to us go on about this stuff and maybe, you know, maybe you know us, maybe you don't, but go find a friend, you know, just find someone who's, who might be slightly interested in this topic too. And like investing is better with friends. If you can't find a buddy who's interested in investing, then come check out seven investing, join our discord. Even on the free side, we've got over a thousand members just chatting investment strategies and stocks, you know, just get the conversation started. I've got a couple of WhatsApp groups with like multiple friends and my investing WhatsApp groups have suddenly come to life because suddenly everybody is uh, excited about investing once again. And I'm just reminding them, like, I've just kept doing this over the, you know, the last couple of years, you should have been doing this with me. But uh, uh, this is a good time to be starting those conversations if you haven't yet. Yeah, uh -oh. although I, I get a little worried about, you know, the, the, the hype cycle when everybody's <laughs> not back in. Like, I think um, I, I do fear my friend Ruben is like a counter signal when he gets really excited about investing that means it's time uh -huh. to sell <laughs> right the inverse jim kramer law right. but yeah no it's important you have a badger and a monkey on your side and we've been through all the cycles and have made all the dumb mistakes or at least i have badger yeah. you seem you seem like you've never made a mistake in your life oh but... god no, that's not true at all i've made a ton <laughs> 3d printing uh, yes it's the future oh right, right. I thought, what is going on with 3d why, why isn't that uh is that why it seemed like such a good idea is that I think it's still real it now goes under the name of additive manufacturing it's grown up a little bit but uh okay. and it's still we never we never did get around to talking about the 
ARK Invest, uh, you know, what's their thing? They're, every year they, you know, they say 2024, you know, what does ARK mm-hmm. think's coming? But it's in there. I think it's under the topic of robotics. They've, they talk about okay. additive manufacturing. So it's still, still a thing um, and it's maturing. But yeah, the stocks I invested in years ago didn't do very well. Okay, well, we'll turn our attention to that in a future episode. I suppose I have uh, one more thing to offer readers, which uh, it's a little bit out there. It's a little bit of a tangent, but uh, for my fire philosophy uh, substack, uh, I'm reading a a book called The Maniac by uh, Benjamin Labatut. This is a fictionalization of a human being that was called the smartest human of the 20th century, John von Neumann. And the, for a long time, until I got to a certain chapter in this book, I thought that the maniac was referring to von Neumann himself. But it's a kind of smart play on words. It's an, it's an actual acronym that stands for Mathematical Analyzer, Numerical Integration, and Computer. This is essentially uh, the world's first computer that von Neumann helped develop. This is, this is, this is real, right? Von Neumann was a real guy. He oh, yeah, yeah, a yeah. bunch of big ideas, and he was instrumental in like, like the, the philosophy of computing, I suppose, a long time ago. Yeah, he did so many things. Yeah. Uh, he, he worked on the uh, Manhattan Project mm-hmm. for the atomic bomb. He developed game theory for economics. Yep. He yep. developed yep. the first computer. And I mean, it's pretty wild what this genius did. This ties in because Oppenheimer shows up in this book a bunch. So I just watched Oppenheimer for the first time uh, three days ago. And so it's the same cohort of people using intense rationality in order to, to some extent, control the world or bring to life in the world things that had never existed. There's one line in here that really stunned me, which is that these inventions brought about by these people were both some of the most creative new inventions ever seen by humanity and simultaneously the most destructive. And it all happened almost at the precise exact time. I know from from hearsay that where this book is going is the advent of AI. It's kind of tracing essentially the roots of how AI formed. <clears throat> certainly, um, some commentators are likening AI to like the development of thermonuclear weapons like decades ago. Um, you know, we could be inventing ourselves into extinction. Who knows? Yeah, and you know, I didn't know. That, well, I didn't know this uh, until I saw the movie. But those lines, uh, I mean, we say it with a chuckle now, but those lines about there being a near zero uh, probability of the entire world blowing up. And I think it was the Matt Damon character yeah. that says like, I'd like those odds to be zero. <laughs> <laughs> but the fear that, we, that when, when they test the weapon, it might set fire to the atmosphere and that's just game over for everybody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I was, I, there is, I've read my Frankenstein and, and, you know, I, I dabble in the moral, moral and ethical philosophies. There is something extraordinarily terrifying about it a group of people who did the math realized that there's a non-zero chance of blowing up the world and they did it anyway. Well, perhaps the really scary thing is um, like then you needed to be a government. You needed incredible resources to be able to um, develop nuclear weapons. Like it's not something you could do in your back garden, but like AI is being developed in like in small laboratories, in schools, um, you know, solo projects, not just AI, but like home brewing biology, designing uh, molecules and then uh, contracting like a lab to, to manufacture them for you. Like it's just becoming cheaper and easier and more accessible. If you want to do something wildly dumb, you know, this is almost within the province of like a lone nutter. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, let's not turn turn to doomsday stuff uh, yet again. We we've, yeah. we've had enough of that. But you know, I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the market, and Nvidia stock is at 744. It was at what one? It not not a year ago. It was down to like 110. I mean, like just absolutely insane. It's as though. I mean, the only, you know, the only other time I've experienced that kind of straight rocket launch was during the internet, what turned out to be the internet uh, bubble. Mm -hmm. The difference being, though, we know that what NVIDIA is making is real money in real use cases. So it's not the same, but this kind of, it's really shocking. And, you know, investing wise, this is the other thing. I did a lot of research into NVIDIA. And I understood you, we, you and I both, right? In fact, you beat me to the punch. For, it was going to be my first recommendation, and yet, uh, you know, in hindsight, I sold it for valuation reasons. Yeah, I trimmed for valuation reasons, but yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's four x since then, I think. So, um, I what's the mistake there? If I could name it, I mean, I had great confidence in Nvidia because of the software portion especially the the coding cuda language that on top of which the which lays on top of the chips that gave me the confidence but the counter narrative i think is i had just lived through 2001 and 2002 and i saw what happened to these valuations for excellent companies you know excellent saas businesses come crashing down because, you know, at some point it's just too wildly, insanely expensive and future cash flows can't justify it. So it's, it's, um, I know I, I, I sometimes think like in the moment in hindsight, everything is clear. I'm not sure, you know, would you, would you be willing to buy NVIDIA right now, Badger at 741? Well, I, I own it. It's probably a 2% allocation in my portfolio. I'm not going to trim it again, but it's it's overvalued. I think a conversation I'm having with my buddy Albert right now, and like I joked about my friend in the WhatsApp group being like a counter signal, but you know clearly markets are a little bit frothy right now. It is feeling a bit like, um, like the hype of, let's say, 2020, 2021. Um, so the conversation I'm having with Albert is, like, how do I identify the most overbaked stocks so that not I can sell them, but so I can trim them, just kind of reduce my exposure a little bit. And um, this is like an, this is an incomplete line of thought, but I welcome your views on this. I'm just going to kind of bucket together companies by their maturity. So, you know, something like an NVIDIA, probably I'm looking at the, the, the valuation ratio I'm probably using is like price to free cash flow. I'm just going to look at its current price to free cash flow related to how that's the trajectory of that over the last couple of years. And I'm just going to try and make a uh, somewhat subjective judgment as to whether I think it's overvalued or not, like notwithstanding the story. And a more mature company like an Alphabet are probably looking at like price to earnings, but doing the same thing. Does that stack up for you as a way of figuring out, like approximating whether something's getting a little ahead of itself? Uh, I've been wrong in this way so many times you, you, the, because the, the, the numbers can go so wildly in each direction that I think I've made as many good decisions as bad ones using fundamental ratios. I think I'm now turning the corner towards using more, uh, using options as insurance. So now NVIDIA is an unusual case because in order to, for example, uh, buy a put or call, you need to have 100 shares. And if you're late, you might not have 100 shares of NVIDIA. But if I had, in theory, uh, 100 shares of NVIDIA, I would not be opposed to buying some puts, which benefit as the price, if the price goes down, exactly the way insurance works. You expect it to go to zero for your house but if it if your house does not catch on fire you're happy to have paid whatever small percentage to to have the peace of mind and there's more complicated stuff you could do too which is also selling calls so you still benefit from some upside which pay for the puts and so forth but that's advanced stuff do you, and, and, and do you have to hedge your individual companies like you said oh you know what if i don't have 100 shares of nvidia 
I mean, can you just hedge the market, do you think? Could you buy puts on the S&P or something or an ETF? And then that essentially gives you the downside cover if just everything turns against growth once again. Yeah, absolutely. It's the it's uh, very easy to do. And you just think about, yeah, that you think about puts as insurance. And so it's not a bad idea for those with large portfolios or portfolios that are heavy in tech stocks because one correction badger the if you take out all the tech stocks from the index all the other stocks are actually now cheaper like still very 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 cheap so this market rally is almost entirely on the back of i would say nvidia nvidia's back in the a in the back of ai uh so it's to me it doesn't feel like a healthy market in the sense and by by that i mean the breadth of the companies participating is very very narrow but that said i just don't think it's a bad idea for those enjoying high gains seeing the indexes at all-time highs or approaching all-time highs to buy a little insurance via puts yeah and like it's a be be wary because when you get into using derivatives, using options, you know, it can, if you don't know what you're doing, you can get in quite a bit of trouble. Um, so do your research before you go there. Um, maybe, maybe the bigger thing though here is, I mean, are we, are, are we talking ourselves into a slightly stronger belief that maybe the market is nearing some new high and maybe, you know, maybe things could turn against us. But the difference I think is, you know, no, nobody knows this, this market rally could last another year, another five years. Um, so, I, my preference is really not to make all in decisions. It's to just, you know, hedge a little bit. I'm not going to sell everything, but you know, I don't use derivatives, but maybe I'll just go slightly higher cash. That's how I kind of hedge. But I think you want to still be in the market. You still want to have exposure to the growth that we're experiencing right now. It's just about being maybe a little bit more cautious at times like this. I mean, this is where I think you and I differ a little bit because I think I've developed my short-term toolkit. I think I personally feel a little bit more confident in the game that plays by a different set of rules. So I'm not as skeptical of options or derivatives. And right now I am, as I won't belabor these points, I am not confident that this rally is being supported by underlying fundamentals. And so I personally am not just cautious, you know, because of the highs, but cautious for all the other reasons. So for new investors, I think Badger's suggestion is wise. It is useful to gain experience, think through these issues, get involved, don't bet anything close to the farm, and then slowly understand, you know, as things unfold, why things move the way they did, and to remember that you can make money in both directions. So it, it, it's just that you, you have to, to go back to the main point of this topic. You have to give yourself the time and space to understand things deeply. So for example, let's say you're sitting here listening to us and you have never used a call or put option. You now have an AI uh, uh, secretary on your laptop, right? Type in calls and puts and take the hour out of your day and learn how they work and build from there. Be careful. Derivatives can burn you. Though, yes, yes, I have been burned many times. And also, uh, the flip side is, I want to reiterate, it's puts especially, it's similar to insurance. You buy it expecting the value to go to zero. But, but those who don't take out insurance are the fools, I would argue, because the risk, it, it ends up being the, the risk uh, ratio, risk reward ratio. So you, you, most reasonable people, I think, think it's yeah, reasonable to uh, sacrifice, let's say 2% of their capital in order to protect the 98%. And so in that sense, in that context, I, uh, options or in this, the way I'm talking about buying puts 
it's not dangerous in the way that Badger's talking about it. Losing is an expected outcome. Makes sense. Yep. But, but I think my key point is just understand what you're doing. If you're using them in appropriately as an insurance policy in the way you describe, that's actually uh, reducing your risk, not increasing your risk. But at the same time, you know, these are, these are tools that can blow up in your face if you um, either misunderstand what it is you're buying or selling, uh, or you just get a bit ex quite excited by, you know, the fun of, of seeing these things swinging around wildly. Um, and then you get drawn into that world and end up as a, an options trader. And then you find yourself on Wall Street bets posting lost porn. That's right. Know yourself. Yeah. 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 Badger, for somebody that was deathly hungover, <clears throat> or is deathly hungover, you have been a magnificent conversation partner this morning. <laughs> I look forward to uh, listening to this sober later as I'm editing it and figuring out if I actually made any sense. But I, I have, I felt I've sobered up live. So thank you for bringing me around. Yeah. <laughs> There's something to be said for your deeper, scratchy, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, not so shrill, <laughs> badgerly voice. So I don't know, maybe get drunk every Sunday night. <laughs> uh, yeah, welcome to my life. <laughs> Well, uh, this was the Wall Street Wildlife Podcast. You can find us on YouTube and all major podcast platforms. Uh, go check out our website, wallstreetwildlife.com. Give us a like and a subscribe. You can also find us on Twitter. Where are we on, where are we on Twitter, Chris? Uh, I'm at 7 Fine Platypus, and Badger is at 7 Luke Hallard. Very good. Uh, and yeah, tweet us. Like, tw Tweeting is our main thing. Tweet us if you've got comments on the episode. If you want to celebrate uh, the Kansas City Chiefs victory with me, if you think AI is going to blow us all up, uh, and tweet us and tell us about like topics you're trying to understand deeply. Cheers. <laughs>